Hello, my name is Catherine Grody, and I'm going to be speaking today on the estimation of soil water content using GPR techniques. I'd like to begin with a short overview of some of the reasons for monitoring soil water content in agriculture. The first and most obvious reason is for irrigation. Irrigation is the largest consumptive use of water in the United States, and water for irrigation has historically been underpriced relative to its economic benefit, which encourages farmers to irrigate. This policy is now changing in many areas, so farmers have both economic and environmental motivation to conserve water. GPR can help determine the water content distribution across the field, so farmers can tell more accurately when to irrigate and what portions of the field should receive more water. A second reason for monitoring soil water content is nutrient application. Many fertilizers are most effective when applied within a given range of soil water content, and farmers can use GPR to measure the water content distribution across the field and to determine if the timing is optimal for fertilizer application. A third reason to monitor soil water content is to reduce surface water and groundwater pollution caused by agrochemical runoff. In the northern Midwest, where irrigation water is very available and inexpensive, there are problems with agrochemical runoff if fertilizers are applied to wet soils or if excessive irrigation is applied soon after agrochemicals are applied. Monitoring the soil moisture prior to agrochemical application can help reduce surface water and groundwater pollution. I'd like to briefly discuss some of the differences between conventional techniques for estimating soil water content and GPR techniques. And I know that most of you are quite familiar with most of the techniques for estimating water content, so I'm not going to discuss the mechanics of each technique, but just cover some of the general characteristics. So of course, augers are the tried and true method of obtaining water content. These are usually our ground truth measurements, and we collect gravimetric water content using the augers. Uh, tensiometers, electrical conductivity meters, and time domain spectrometry, or TDR, are sensors used for water content estimation. And each of these four techniques, augers, tensiometers, electrical conductivity, and TDR, can provide accurate estimates of water content, but they are all point measurement techniques. So if we're looking to characterize the distribution of water content or to understand the heterogeneity of water content across the field, it's really not possible using these techniques. Additionally, if we're collecting gravimetric water content using augers, although we get very accurate measurements, the technique is destructive, so we can't monitor changes in water content with time. Tensiometers, electroconductivity, and TDR will let us measure changes in water content with time at one location. Tensiometers and electrical conductivity are somewhat limited in the accuracy in that they typically require a soil-specific calibration to get very accurate estimates of water content. Both of these techniques do a very nice job of measuring changes in water content with time, but to be very accurate, soil-specific calibration is usually necessary. TDR is a little bit more robust. It doesn't typically require a soil-specific calibration for accurate water content estimates, but it tends to be more expensive than the other techniques. In contrast to the point measurements, remote sensing data covers obviously a very large area. For agriculture applications, sometimes remote sensing data is pretty useful. If we're looking at the field scale, the resolution of the remote sensing data is usually too coarse to show us heterogeneity within a field. Another limitation with remote sensing data is that the sampling depth is typically quite small, usually only a couple centimeters, and there are characteristics of the field, such as vegetation, which can reduce the accuracy of remote sensing data. GPR is interesting because it sort of bridges the gap between the point measurements and the remote sensing data in terms of resolution. The GPR data be can be collected at whatever resolution you desire, and therefore you can capture the heterogeneity across a field by collecting higher resolution GPR data. GPR data also have the advantage of being able to be acquired multiple times at one site. Data are typically non-invasive, so we can capture changes in water content with time. GPR data also have a greater sampling depth than remote sensing data, so we're more likely to capture the depth of interest, the root zone, for agricultural applications. For the rest of this presentation, I'd like to talk about how to use GPR for soil water content estimation. I'm going to begin by talking about how GPR measurements can be related to soil water content, and then I'm going to focus on how to obtain the GPR measurements necessary to estimate soil water content. Starting with how to relate GPR measurements to water content, we need to remember that the data recorded by the GPR receiver are amplitude and time. High amplitudes tell us that more energy has arrived at the receiver, often from a reflection. 
We can then either assume an electromagnetic velocity to find the depth to the reflector, or we can use information about the travel path in conjunction with the arrival time to determine the velocity. For purposes of GPR water content estimation, we primarily want to measure the velocity as the velocity is a parameter that is most sensitive to water content. In practice, the electromagnetic velocity is usually converted to a parameter referred to as the dielectric permittivity, where the permittivity is the square of the ratio between the velocity of an electromagnetic wave in a vacuum, or the speed of light, c, and the measured electromagnetic velocity of the soil, v. The approximation for dielectric permittivity is only appropriate under relatively low loss conditions, meaning that the electrical conductivity of a site is relatively low. If a site contains especially high percentage of clay minerals, or if the soils that a site are saline, the approximation for dielectric permittivity may not be valid. Beneath the dielectric permittivity approximation is a table providing the permittivities and electromagnetic velocities of common geologic materials. The permittivity of air, by definition, is 1, the permittivity of fresh water is 81, and the permittivity of seawater ranges from 81 to 88, with 81 being a more common value. Although the electrical conductivity of seawater is much greater than that of freshwater, the dielectric permittivities of seawater and freshwater are approximately equal. These values demonstrate that dielectric permittivity is relatively independent of electrical conductivity. And this is one of the strengths of using dielectric permittivity methods for estimating soil water content. If a soil has a high dielectric permittivity, it contains a high proportion of soil water, not merely a small percentage of soil water that has a higher electrical conductivity. Beneath the permittivities of water are the permittivities of dry sand and dry clay, and these values are very similar for both types of soil, showing that permittivity is relatively independent of mineralogy. The next two rows show the permittivities for wet sand and wet clay. These permittivities are much higher than for the dry soils, and there's a significant amount of overlap between the permittivities of wet sand and wet clay. Clay has the potential for the highest permittivities because clays have the highest porosity. So if a clay is completely saturated, it has a higher percentage of pore water within the soil. In summary, this table shows that air and water have very low and high permittivities respectively, and that a soil that is primarily filled with air in the voids will have a relatively low dielectric permittivity, whereas a soil that has a lot of water in the voids is going to have a higher permittivity value. Thus, a dielectric permittivity measurement can be related directly to the proportion of water in the soil pores. Once we've determined the dielectric permittivity using GPR techniques, the next step is to convert that into a water content, and we have uh, several petrophysical relationships used to do that. There are two main types of petrophysical relationships. The first type are empirical relationships, which can be developed either for specific soils or for general groups of soils. Empirical relationships are usually developed by taking measurements of the dielectric permittivity, either with TDR or GPR, over a range of soil water contents. One of the most commonly used empirical relationships was developed by uh, Top and others using a range of agricultural soils to develop this polynomial relationship between dielectric permittivity and soil water content. For maximum accuracy, site-specific or soil-specific empirical relationships can be developed. Other relationships based upon soil texture are also available. One of the main advantages of using empirical relationships for water content estimation is that these relationships typically ha only have dielectric permittivity as an input. So if a site has significant heterogeneity across the site, or if a site has very poor soil characterization, an empirical relationship can be used to get a first estimate of soil water content without much knowledge of the other parameters of the soil. The second type of petrophysical relationship is a volumetric mixing model. For volumetric mixing models, the volumetric water content is related to the bulk or measured dielectric permittivity of the soil, shown here as kappa, and the dielectric permittivities of the soil components. Here those are the permittivities of the soil solids, kappa sub s, the permittivity of air, kappa sub a, and the permittivity of the pore water, kappa sub w. Alpha is a geometric mixing factor, usually assumed to be one half. One of the advantages of volumetric mixing models is that they have shown under laboratory conditions to be more accurate than some empirical relationships. One of the main disadvantages is that the porosity, n, has to be known f 
to apply a volumetric mixing model. At many sites, the porosity is unknown, or at sites with significant soil texture heterogeneity, the porosity varies across a field site. Thus, although mixing models have been shown to be very accurate in the laboratory, in practice, under field conditions, empirical relationships are more commonly used. So the second part of this presentation is going to talk about different GPR methods for estimating the permittivity. And I'm going to talk about four different uh, GPR techniques we can use to find permittivity. The first is going to be ground coupled reflections. Next I'll talk about ground waves, and then air launch reflections, and finally borehole methods. So ground coupled reflections are probably the most familiar type of GPR data to most users. And I'm going to begin by talking about the common offset mode, since that is uh, again, the, the most common way that GPR data are acquired. So in the common asset mode, of course, the transmitter and receiver are kept a set distance apart and pulled along a traverse, and measurements are taken as you go along the traverse. And typically, we'll see a reflection from an interface, and we'll either measure the velocity or we'll assume a velocity, and say the velocity is constant along this traverse, and then we can calculate the depth to an interface. If we're looking for the water content, we're not going to assume that the velocity is, is constant. Rather, we'll need to know the depth to a reflector at some point. We'll measure the travel time of the wave from the surface to the reflector and back. And we'll use that travel time to calculate the velocity. The main advantage of using ground coupled reflections in the common offset mode are that data can be acquired along a traverse. So again, you can get high resolution data acquired fairly quickly. Uh, the other big advantage is that the sampling depth is the deepest of any GR GPR technique because the sampling depth is going to be the depth from the ground surface to whatever interface you're using. The obvious disadvantage is that you have to know the depth to the interface. So ground coupled common offset reflections are most useful in either engineered soils such as uh, pavements or some golf courses where the depth to soil interfaces is well known before the survey. Uh, or you could use it in natural soils if you determine the depth of the interface using a secondary technique such as boreholes. So in this example, you could use boreholes to determine the depth to the bedrock reflection, and then by looking at the travel time from the surface to the reflection, you could calculate the water content of the soil along the traverse. The second way that ground coupled reflections can be used for water content estimation is in variable offset mode. For variable offset surveys, the transmitting and receiving tenors are incrementally moved further apart for each measurement, resulting in a longer travel path and therefore a longer travel time for each measurement. In the schematic shown below, a uh, radiogram for a reflection is shown where you can see that the reflected travel times form a hyperbola as the distance between the transmitter and receiving antennas increase. This is a radar gram of variable offset GPR data showing a GPR reflection which has the expected hyperbola shape. Most commercially available GPR software packages will fit hyperbolas to GPR reflection events and this hyperbola fitting provides the velocity of the reflection. The velocity can then be used to estimate the average water content from the ground surface to the interface generating the reflection. The main advantage of using variable offset methods for water content estimation is that you don't need to know the depth of the reflector in order to calculate the velocity. The main disadvantage is that variable offset data are much more time consuming to collect than common offset data. So you could acquire several variable offset surveys across a site to estimate water content at various points, but it's not really practical using conventional GPR antenna to collect variable offset data across an entire site. So you can't use variable offset methods to capture the heterogeneity of water content across the site. The second main technique for estimating water content using GPR is using GPR groundways. Ground waves travel directly between the transmitter and the receiver in the shallow subsurface. And so the travel path is simply the uh, separation distance between the transmitter and receiving antennas. The main advantage of using ground waves for water content estimation is that they don't require a reflective interface to see the ground wave. And therefore, ground waves can be acquired in more situations than uh, reflective waves. The sampling depth of ground waves is typically less than you would see for reflector waves. The sampling depth uh, 
ranges from 10 to 30 centimeters. The sampling depth is slightly frequency dependent, so you see greater sampling depths with lower frequency antennas. Grounders can be collected in either common offset or variable offset mode. In common offset mode, the velocity is calculated by looking at the separation distance, which is easily measured on the surface between the transmitter and receiver, and recording the travel time of the ground wave between the two antennas. Variable offset mode data are also quite easy to calculate. If ground waves are collected in variable offset mode, the ground wave is usually the second event that you see on a radiogram. The first event is the airwave. It has a low slope and a high velocity, and it's easily recognized by having the velocity of electromagnetic wave in air. The ground wave will have a lower velocity and also a linear slope. It's very easy to calculate the velocity because it's simply the inverse of the slope for the ground wave. Although ground waves have the advantage of being collected in more locations than uh, reflections, they do have some limitations. One of the limitations is that if there is a shallow reflector at the site, that shallow reflector can arrive uh, relatively early in time and either reflections or refla refractions from the interface can superimpose with the ground wave so we don't get a good ground wave signal and therefore can't calculate the velocity. Another problem that can happen with ground waves is, this, is that if you have soil with high attenuation, the ground wave signal may die out at longer antenna separations and therefore the only ground wave signal you might get may occur at early antenna separations where there is some superposition between the ground wave and the air wave. So even though ground waves can be applied in, in more situations than reflections, you still have to be careful about the conditions in which ground waves are acquired. And it's essential to acquire variable offset data at locations throughout your field to make sure that you're interpreting your ground wave data correctly. In common offset mode, the velocity is determined by looking at the travel time between the time when the signal first leaves the antenna, or the zero time, which is usually calculated relative to the airwave arrival time, and the arrival time of the ground wave. So this example of common offset data, where this is a section in the middle where uh, water has been poured in infiltrated infiltration zone, and then the soil is drier to either side of the infiltration zone. And you can see that in the infiltrated zone, the velocity is lower, and hence the travel time is longer to the ground wave than it is to the sides where the soil is drier and the velocity is faster. This is an example of some common offset ground wave data acquired across an, a, a seven acre alfalfa field using six traverses. In the southeast corner of the field we had pivot, pivot irrigation applied the morning before data were acquired. And these are 500 megahertz uh, ground wave data and you can see that the ground wave data capture the pivot irrigation quite nicely and they also saw variations in water content across the field both within the irrigated section and in the unirrigated section. The third technique for using GPR for water content estimation is to use air launched reflections. Air launched reflections have historically been used primarily in the transportation industry for pavement evaluation. The upper figure shows a typical configuration using GPR for pavement quality control. The lower picture shows an image of a air launch data that could be used for agricultural purposes for water content estimation. Air launch data have the advantage over ground coupled techniques such as reflections or ground waves because air launch data can be acquired very quickly in the pavement applications. Sometimes data are collected at, at 40 miles an hour, although in agricultural applications, of course, they're usually collected more slowly. You can also lift the GPR antenna up higher off the ground. Air launch reflections can be acquired as far as two meters off the ground. The method for calculating the dielectric permittivity is different for air launch reflections than it is for ground coupled reflections or for ground waves. For the ground coupled techniques, we're primarily looking at the velocity found by using the travel time and a known travel path. Whereas for air launch reflections, we're more interested in looking at the amplitude of the reflection from the air-soil interface. And there's two main ways that we can look at the amplitudes to find the permittivity. The first and more conventional way is to relate the amplitude of the reflection from the air-soil interface, which is A sub S, to the amplitude from a perfect reflector, typically a metal plate. And using these two amplitudes, 
from the air soil interface and the amplitude from the metal plate, we can calculate the dielectric permittivity. One disadvantage with this technique is that the reflection from both the soil surface and the metal plate must be taken at the same height of both the ground surface, so you're not allowed to have the antenna change height as you drive across a field. The other disadvantage is that sometimes it's difficult to find a metal plate large enough to capture the entire footprint of a GPR signal, especially if you're using lower frequencies which have a larger footprint. Therefore, air launch data are typically uh, collected using fairly high frequency antennas. The second method for processing air launch reflection data is to use full waveform inversion. Full waveform inversion is different from conventional methods of processing air launch data because full waveform inversion uses the entire waveform, not just the maximum amplitude from the air soil interface like conventional data. Full waveform inversion tends to be more accurate than conventionally processed air launched reflections and also doesn't require calibration from a metal plate which allows more flexibility in the height of the antenna above the soil surface. A disadvantage of full waveform inversion is that it's much more computationally intensive. The processing is more complicated and currently there's no commercially available software to perform full waveform inversion, although that may change in the future. Some disadvantages to both conventional processing and full waveform inversion when using air launched reflections is that the sampling depth for air launched reflections is fairly low. Typically the sampling depth is 5 centimeters or less, so it doesn't necessarily capture the water content over the root zone that we need to consider. Other disadvantages are that both techniques require fairly smooth soil surface, uh, typically between 2 and 4 centimeters of variation in uh, soil elevation is all that is acceptable, so it doesn't work as well if you have a rough surface such as a plowed field. You can also have reductions in accuracy if you have vegetation on the field, if you have large changes in electrical conductivity across the field, or if the water content profile changes vertically. So although air launch reflections have significant advantages in that they can be acquired quickly and that at least using conventional methods the data processing is, is quite simple, there's still some significant limitations at this point in using air launch reflections on an agricultural setting. The final method for GPR estimation of water content that I will cover in this presentation is GPR borehole methods. Borehole methods are not a reconnaissance tool in the same way that ground coupled reflections, ground waves, or air launched reflections are, but they are very useful for obtaining detailed information about the water content over a small area. There are two main ways that borehole data can be acquired. The first method is using zero offset profiling, or the ZOP mode. In zero offset profiling, the transmitting antenna and receiving antenna are each lowered down a borehole with the transmitting antenna and the receiving antenna being at the same depth for each measurement. To estimate the velocity in zero offset profiling mode, the distance between the two boreholes is measured, as well as the travel time from the first borehole to the second borehole, and an average velocity is calculated for each depth. In the second mode, which is multiple offset profiling, or MOP, the transmitting antenna is held at one depth and then the receiving antenna is slowly lowered from the ground surface to the bottom of the borehole and measurements are acquired along the entire length of the borehole. Then the transmitting antenna is lowered down to the second measurement location. The receiving antenna is again brought to the top of the borehole, lowered down to the bottom while measurements are repeated. In multiple offset profiling, the data can be inverted to give you a tomographic profile of the water content between the two boreholes, so you have a much more detailed image of the water content distribution than you do with zero offset profiling where you only get an average water content. So this is an image of a tomographic profile using the multiple offset profiling with the borehole techniques, and you can see that you have a very nice uh, image of the water content distribution, and it's uh, a nice way of imaging permeable pathways in between the two boreholes. So again, although borehole methods aren't applicable on a broad scale for agricultural applications. They are useful for studies such as infiltration studies or looking for permeable pathways. I see that I've used up my allotted 20 minutes of time, so I'm going to quickly summarize the main points of the presentation. The first is that we can use GPR parameters, either velocity, usually determined using travel time, if you're using ground coupled methods, 
or amplitudes if you're using air launch methods to measure the dielectric permittivity. Once the permittivity has been estimated, we can relate that to volumetric water content using petrophysical relationships. Finally, there are four main GPR techniques commonly used to measure water content. The first is ground coupled reflections, either common offset or variable offset reflections. The advantage of ground coupled reflections are that they have the greatest sampling depth. The sampling depth is e equal to the distance between the ground surface and the reflective interface. The main disadvantage is that a reflective interface is required for this technique to work. Ground waves do not require a reflective interface and therefore can be applied in more situations but have a shallower sampling depth, usually less than 30 centimeters. And ground waves can sometimes be ineffective if you have shallow reflectors at the site or if you have soils with very high attenuation. Air launch reflections can be acquired very quickly but have a very shallow sampling depth, usually less than 5 centimeters, and the accuracy of air launch reflections is restricted by the roughness of the soil and other factors such as vegetation and changes in water content. Finally, borehole methods provide a way of getting very detailed information about the water content distribution between two boreholes but are not really applicable as a reconnaissance tool. I look forward to answering any questions you have during the webinar on September 30th. Thanks for paying attention.